CEOs and salespeople are confident that their opinion is the right one. Are they? Welcome to the CEO and Salesman podcast, where we talk about today's business issues and we'll let you work out who's right. It's me, by the way. Hi, welcome again to the CEO and Salesman podcast, where we talk about business topics and uh, we, we're really interested in growth and, and how we can actually help companies grow. So um, welcome to my co-host, Daniel. How are you going today? Hey, Matt, great to see you here. I, um, I found it funny that you were equivocating over your intro. You know no one's going to watch this yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We're doing it for you are, entertainment, aren't we? That, that's right. And if you are watching it, thank you from the bottom of our heart. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Don't yeah, that's really to, amazing. We've got to tick subscribe. Is that right? Exactly. So yeah, hit subscribe. Or, or uh, that's right. So we're we're on uh, Spotify now. We're on YouTube. So hopefully we can uh, we provide you some value. So how's your week been, mate? It's really, really good. I, I know just before we jumped on, we we're having a chat about things are going. We just couldn't stop talking, so we should have just started recording. But um, it's there's been a lot. Of, I feel like there's a, an uptick in activity, Matt. How about you? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, two new sales this week, and uh, well, actually, just yesterday, uh, I've actually found a bit of seasonality. I'm thinking about trends. I like to think, you know, sort of zoom out every now and then and, and look at my business and. I'm the last three years around about this time, there seems to be a high level of enthusiasm to actually get in and get, get stuff happening. What about yourself? Yeah, look at how, because we do ERP, it's common because you've just coming out of, you've come out of a financial year and your new budget cycle started and if part of the strategy is to implement system upgrades, the people want to, you know, get going only. But for the last two years, it's been very hard, obviously, we had lockdown and pandemic. And, yeah. and I'd like to think it's because of all the hard work that I did in the last 12 months of marketing, but probably the reality is there's, there's, there's an increase in activity in the market and, uh, yeah. and we've got to make sure we can, we can take, take, take advantage of that. But uh, it's good. It's a confidence builder when, when you just see lots of inquiries going on. It's, it's really good. Yeah, I'm right, but haven't, haven't we seen yeah. the government come out with some, out, uh, with some interesting comments around there's a 50% chance of recession? What, what does that even mean? Thought we weren't going to talk about this bad mojo, man. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a confidence. Like, what does fifty percent mean? Fifty percent of disaster, or fifty percent of like continued growth? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how to assess it. It's even worse than that if you think about it. Um, it's fifty percent chance of recession, but inflation's high, and the response is to put interest rates up, so the costs are going to go up again. Um, it's a tough call. I, I. I and, and then they come along and say, it's all confidence driven. Well, and, and they're true, of course, the economists and stuff like that. But one way to dampen the confidence is to tell everybody is going to go bad. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Um, but I, I, look, as a small business, it's not like we're, we're, um, we're going to see, uh, we don't need thousands of sales. No, we no. need a dozen sales, right? So I think if things um, contract, can, if they do, we're still only after a dozen sales. Yeah. But out of all of Australia, we think we can find a dozen sales. And I, I think that's the one thing we need to focus on as business owners. If you're in small and medium, now, if you're a massive, big multinational, big construction company right now, you're, you're in pain. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Different, different macroeconomic things that influence the bottom line. But we've mentioned the word a couple of times and uh, around growth. And so mm. a lot of our listeners if there are is anybody out there uh but certainly my customers you know being marketing customers and your customers they're, they're interested in growing their businesses and often the conversation comes up oh we need to get you know uh more sales people we need more of that sales activity happening to to grow so what's your interpretation of that i hate that question though <laughs> i hate it with a passion I, i'll tell you i'll tell you i'll tell you why and maybe some of you that are listening can appreciate it I've been in very large companies where their strategic plan to grow to grow the company was to double the size of the sales force, and I've been in the red. Didn't grow the size, just cost it just cost more, flattened everybody's um, um, OTE, and and it was really painful for about three years. Um, so out of that direct experience and owning my own companies, um, uh, particularly what we do though, because we we are ERP, and I suspect that question means different things to different companies. You might have. Yeah in that than me um, for us to sell our solutions it's a very complex exercise so if you're doing big machines big complex software that person that's able to do that top down in the company is very rare very hard to train i would like them to be doing that all the time 
Now, yeah. if I want to grow my company, I need to get more leads. And yep. then this conversation devolves into, but isn't the salesperson responsible for getting leads? Well, yes, but everybody is <laughs> in that mm. sense, right? I am service people are, but the salesperson is responsible to convert on the customer. That's right. Marketing discipline generates leads. Yeah. So what, yeah, what you- absolutely. Like, um, but you know, of course, you know, to, to be the other side of that, if your job is to go door knocking or selling coffee beans to cafes, you do need to put more boots on the ground, and those yeah. salespeople, you do need to put more salespeople out there. If you've got that direct contact, if you're selling vacuum cleaners door to door, you need more people. That was one of my first jobs out of school. Uh, if you need yeah. more people actually knocking on doors at seven in the morning, handing out free, you know, room cleaning vouchers, which I did. Um, Matt, but, I was uh, just going to yeah. say that explains a lot about you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. That was yeah. if you if you want to learn how to do sales. That's uh, you know knocking mm. on people's door at seven in the morning to offer them a free, you know, carpet clean is um is hard. And that that vacuum was like three and a half thousand uh, dollars. It was about twenty five wow. years ago. So that was a that was a great training. But uh, it's all part of the part of the mix. But you know, I, I think that when you get to a certain level, when when a business gets to a certain level, we need to start separating have the, the separation of church and state, separation of sales and marketing. They need to work together. Because they they sit underneath the, uh, the the I guess the banner of how do we actually gain more market share or sell more things, but really you know doing uh, lead generation is often not what a salesperson's there to do, and and really yeah and, and coming in is is it's the fuel. So I think about the the machinery. I think about the machinery of getting more sales in the door is a machine. You can have a really great engine, so that's a really great salesperson, but without fuel. You're actually not going to go anywhere. You know, tech talk machinery engine, awesome way to oh, segue in that. <laughs> so, but, you know what? I'm loving that. the analogy. I'm, I'm going to run with it because what ABM has done for us, even though we're a small business company, we had the marketing disciplines handing over a lead to the salespeople and the salespeople going, yeah, that's not right. And then we just lived with it and we did conversion rates and said, okay, we've got to improve this. What ABM did was completely turn that on its head. Marketing is still an engine. It's still doing what it's doing. The person in the driver's seat is now the rep. The yep. rep's directing the activity of the marketing engine to fill their pipe. So they're yes. working as one team. Where you see a lot of companies, marketing meetings are separate from sales meetings. They're completely separate. You're right. Yep. Yeah. And I've been in meetings. I've been in I've been in businesses where salespeople look at marketing and they think, oh, these guys are over in the corner doing arts and crafts. And That's the marketing right. people look at the salespeople and say, oh, these guys are just interested in having lunch and having a nice time and high-fiving each <laughs> other like a bunch of bros. And, uh, and, and really, it's, if you don't bring those two together, you're, you're really going to be in trouble. Actually, one thing, uh, Daniel, is you mentioned ABM, and, and I know what that is, uh, and it's account-based marketing. Do you want to just um, give the, the listeners, if there are any, a, um, a refresher on what you perceive as account-based marketing? Yeah, look, watch episode one. No, sorry. <laughs> Seriously, we didn't get through episode one because we talked about it. But um, no, account-based marketing, just to really simplify it, it's where you take all your marketing activities and you create the campaigns that are driven by actually filling a, a target account lists um, for your reps or even for an individual rep because you may be specialising in what they do. So what that meant for us, for example, we had volume-based marketing going on before spending $100,000 a year on paid, um, had lots of blocks going out. Lots of, we were competing with the really big players that just spend millions on this stuff, right? Yeah. Um, what we did instead is we took a bucket load of budget and we found 3,000 companies and we're now marketing and reps are working together to cut it down to 200. And we had a really great experience this week. We hit, um, we hit a company that said, look, you can't help, help us right now, but give us, give us a call in two years. That is gold. They know about us now, we're in touch with them, we're talking to the right people and we'll help them understand who we are over the next two years. If we had known this 12 years ago, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be having to do all this other stuff. We would have that list of companies sorted out. And out of 200, we're looking to close a dozen a year. We're not, mm. we're not, not looking to close thousands of transactions. And that's what ABM did for us, yeah. This is, this is a really important conversation because it's actually... A lot of people talk about, you know, less is more, but, uh, you know, but, but in the marketing world, people always say more is more. We need to do more of this or more of that. We need more reps. We need more activity. But really, if we were to think about our marketplace and really ad- understand and identify 
the, 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 the perfect target customer or the customer who's going to get the most value out of it, what they're thinking, what keeps them awake at night, all the normal marketing sort of things that we do. But then going to the stage of understanding where they are and surrounding themselves with valuable content so they, they develop trust with the brand, then it becomes a natural thing where they go ahead and say, well, I, it's time for me to put my hand up. But one thing that we need to make sure happens and occurs in marketing that I've found over the course of the last while is business put out a lot of high quality content, but until they actually ask the customer to contact them, mm. then the, the appointment book is still not full. So you can have customers, you, a lot of people, and I see it as well. I, I receive a lot of content. I, I review a lot of content. A lot of stuff comes in, but unless the customer or unless the company says, contact us now for this, make some sort of call to action, you're still just going to be a passive receiver of information, even though it might be high quality. Yeah, and that's that, that feeds into that conversation about the discipline actually hasn't changed. Marketing mm -hmm. discipline hasn't changed, but our channels have changed considerably. We have not done any paid in six months and we've got more leads. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> how crazy is that, right? Cool. <laughs> it is crazy. And I had a paid specialist in my team and his, his whole job was to do paid. So when I wanted to cut it, he was nervous he was going to lose his job. So no, there are many other things you can do for us. And now he is like, I can't believe we waste all that money over those years, right? Yeah. Because you go to any marketing agency, they will give you a proposal where they want to take a fee on how much you spend on paid. Yep. Who are they really serving? Yep. <laughs> it's, 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 sorry to be negative about that, Matt, but I, I found that experience really difficult um, when I went out to market for an agency, yeah. Yeah, and look, you know what? I um, had a conversation with LinkedIn yesterday. I actually spoke with LinkedIn reps because we actually manage LinkedIn advertising for some of our customers. And and every time I speak with them, I get a different version of what the what the truth is for today. And, mm. and how that occurs to me is that these platforms, and I'm not rubbish, but people are out there making a lot of money. And i got clients making a lot of money selling or, or advertising through LinkedIn, um, some with Facebook and, uh, and, and those types of platforms. But those platforms are a, a continually moving target. You're trying to hit a target, a moving target, you know, from the water during a storm. Like it's really yeah. hard to hit. And so you've got to, and also one of the big things they tell you is that you've got to teach the algorithm, which means you just need to be okay with burning off thousands and thousands of dollars to teach the algorithm. So it's I'm not teach, saying it's a, if you've got teach teach Google how to give them money. It's it's, it's, it's all I'm hearing. But what we what are we, we we probably really need to clarify? ABN's the B two B. All right, yes, it's, it's not absolutely. a B two C marketing um, yep. approach. So um, so that's that's really important to understand. And also, I think um, like also when you're small and you don't have these big budgets. Where do you put your limited resources? And to me, what ABM taught us, put your limited resources into finding those 10 people that want to have a conversation with you. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And if there's a thousand that don't, okay, move on. <laughs> because you only need 10 deals, right? Yep. And of course, the, the numbers change depending on the type of business you are. But That's right. Yeah, I, ABM, I, I suspect we're going to be talking about it a lot over, over the course of these <laughs> sessions. No, it's really powerful. Yeah. Look, I, 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 that's how I started my business, how I started my consulting business, you know, MatthewWyatt.com, which was they, you know, the, the pre, I guess the predecessor of that to, to my business now. And I recognized that I had a certain skill set in the technology space. I've always only ever done and worked in the technology space. I know sales and marketing in that space. So I actually sent out letters uh, with a little globe stress ball to people um, directly. And posted yeah. them and then followed them up yeah. because I knew that this hundred, well, actually 200 people were, if I picked up three or four of those, that would set my business up because it was only a business of me yeah. for the year. And that's all I did. And so I and wasn't about the thousands of people or Facebook or TikTok dances. So not that anybody wants to see me do a TikTok dance. Um, but, you know, the idea there is you can go massive or you can go really narrow and know exactly who you're dealing with and, and make a difference. Yeah, and I suspect every listener that's been through that self-startup bootstrap thing had to do that. Yeah. And then what happens is we grow and we get more money. We, we think, oh, marketing is going to solve it for us. I don't have to do that anymore. Guess what? <laughs> you just have to keep doing it forever. It's just the way it is. And, of course, when you get big in enterprise, you get funding and then you get teams to come in and do that for you. But wouldn't it be great if you built your business in such a way that that energy that you put into starting your company is owned by your reps? Yeah, 
That's right. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go start that business, man. <laughs> yeah, okay, good idea. All right, done. Yeah, absolutely. So look, um, with, with uh, you know, we're, we're trying to continually talk about growth. We're, we're trying to uh, help the people listening. So is there something that, you know, you think that you've seen in the last couple of months that people should be thinking about when it comes to their business and, and, and growing their business? Yeah, uh, look, um, great question. Um, I'll, I'll throw this one out of the blue to you. I don't think um, management or leadership in companies really understanding the customer journey conversation. Oof. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I did some presentation to some of our customers recently, and I just mapped their business from beginning to getting paid on the invoice and then ongoing services and then getting a case study. I put it all on one page for them and then defined KPIs. And I mean, this is not a self-sell. That The CEOs came out of that going, look, we know it. We kind of run it, but we don't do it with the business. Yeah. They don't have, they don't sit the entire team down and, and do it because everybody has their siloed responsibilities. Yes. Um, so if you want to, for me, growing a company, first of all, there's nothing you personally will do, Matt. There's nothing I personally will do. Um, it has to be the team. And I think if the team is on the journey of the customer and every single point we're maximizing value, you will grow. You'll grow through word of mouth, quite frankly. Um, yeah, absolutely. And you, yeah, that's, and that's my belief. Does, does that yeah. go into a conversation about vision and mission or do we do that another time? Oh, boy. Didn't we want to keep this to 20 minutes? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, maybe, but, yeah. we should, maybe we should dog whistle for the, the, for, uh, the, the next um, conversation. But, you know, so a lot of businesses grab their vision and mission. They, they talk about how, you know, at an offsite, they all cheer about how developing that. And then they go have a hangover or they have a few drinks. They have the hangover and it lasts about as long as the hangover does that they commit yeah. to that vision. So, you know, how do you perceive those uh, you know, vision and mission conversations vision and mission. or visions and missions inside your own organizations? Yeah, look, it is related to customer journey because um, first of all, uh, everybody needs to know it. It needs to be more than just something you say. Um, it needs to be something that we believe. Um, and then if you don't have believers in your business, unfortunately, as a CEO, you have to be ruthless and cut them. You cannot afford to have a single person in your company that thinks your vision's a joke. It's just, it's, they're, they are cancer. And your yeah. company they may be the best technical people in the world by the way um but if they think it's a joke you've got to cut them um for me i think vision and mission is a tool that i use all the time on how to make decisions and most importantly how do i say no to something so if somebody brings me an opportunity a proposal um, a business partnership and it is not part of our vision and mission the answer is no i'm sorry we're just not going to do it yeah um even if the you know, this gets complicated. Either if the financial opportunity is so big and your vision and mission is really important to you, why would you compromise what you believe for money? Yeah. That's a tough and, one, right? <laughs> so, well, the commercial realities are often such that new businesses or small businesses need to have that conversation internally all the time. But what I've, uh, just an example from my life is that uh, we developed a vision and mission for a customer um, in, in the farming space and they were approached by um, a couple of multinationals one was in insurance and one was in fertilizer and by holding that vision and mission clear in their mind they were able to strongly negotiate with these two massive organizations because their job was to create their part of their vision was to create certainty for their customers. Right. And in doing that, they were able to negotiate uh, the fertilizer or the insurance and, and, and other elements of the business by creating that long-term engagement. And it wasn't just about the money because it was, if it was just about the money, these large multinationals might've been able to sway them or move them off their, off their stance because, well, here's a lot of money. Let me get access to your customer base. And that's sometimes a, a reasonably good marriage, but we want to make sure, they wanted to make sure that their customers were being served because if those customers are served, they get a better relationship with the product and the service, and then they're going to come back next year and rebuy and tell their friends about it. So it's creating this, but that vision had to be held strongly. And it was, it was buffeted by the, by the, um, by the, by excitement and, and potential money that was, was going to be thrown around there. So it was really mm. very important to hold the line. So this is what we're about. This is what we stand for. 
and by holding that line, they're able to create a much better uh, engagement with the with the you know with the with the thousand pound gorilla uh, being the multinational and their customer base, which was reasonably underserved. So it's yeah, that, so that but yeah, it needed to be front and center of their mind. And when we went into those conversations, we needed to make sure that we spoke about that before we went into those conversations. Yeah, I, I love that story, Matt. One of the one aspect of it was about their customers and the value they give, which was certainty. The other aspect was it about how much they could make. Yep. Now, if they wanted to make a lot of money and leave, I guess that's okay. It's a decision. If they want long-term business where their customers respect them, you've got to go with the value prop. And, yeah. uh, and, and uh, so that's, that's, that's an awesome conversation. And by the way, we should say as well, like many people get into business for different reasons. Um, and having a vision, I'm built that way. I need to believe in what I'm doing. Not everybody's built that way. That doesn't make me better or worse. It just, it's just different, right? But if you look at the really big companies that believe in what they do, the reason they got big is because they believe in what they do. That's that's kind of that's the difference. So if you aspire to being very successful, and there's nothing wrong with being a, a very big company then it's not me because I haven't achieved that. Um, but every company that I look at that I respect, they've had very strong values, very strong, a very strong vision and a laser-like mission from what they were doing. Yeah. Have you become yeah. more vision and mission focused as you've gotten older? Yeah. Yeah, because um, as your team grows uh, and you need more people with different skill sets, and it's hard to relate to all of them because sometimes they're just doing things you don't understand. Um, uh, the only thing that unifies us is our vision, mission, and values, actually. So uh, I, I think, look, at, at CEO is a special role. Um, I'm the embodiment of vision and mission that the board wants <laughs> and, and myself as well, right? So that's yeah. it's a very special role. And um, if you're the sales manager, you're not that role, right? Mm. But they need leadership in what is the vision, mission, and values of our company. Otherwise, they can go and do silly things. They can make sales that are good, bad for the company. You yep. know? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I've, I've so anyway, I, I, as, I'm not sure if it's as I've gotten older. I think it's as I've gotten into the into the top role that I've really finally understood what it all means and why it's a value. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love yeah. that. That's, that's yeah. I, I echo that very much. You know, in the, my first company, when I started when I was 22, um, yeah. it was about making money. But then over time, it became about, you know, other things and service and, and developing a relationship with customers and developing. And so when salespeople who were new and, and, and gun salespeople came along and tried to do deals that were outside of the uh, parameters, and they said, but we're going to make a lot of money out of it. Uh, I, I then had that spider sense or that, that that way of going, well, no, this is where we want to go as a business. And the better I was at articulating that mission and vision for myself and then to my team, it became easier to say no. And like you said, it becomes a lever or a, or a way to say no and direct people. And by, and, but of course, it's always going to be tested. Things are, things are built to be tested. And so if somebody comes along and says, I know our vision and mission is this, but I've got a great idea. It's going to make us a ton of money, but it might compromise that. They're not going to say that overtly, but you know, we've got a great opportunity. We're going to make a lot of money, solve all our problems. Unless there is a real strong attachment to that uh, vision and mission, you, it gets tested, it gets broken, and no longer do you have a realistic or respected uh, vision and mission inside the business. And that's, yeah, and, that's, and, when, that's when small business gets tested. That's right. And unless you're really clear with what your values and your vision and mission is, how are customers meant to find you? Yeah. If you do everything, how does some, somebody Google everything? <laughs> like it's just, <laughs> it's not a meaningful thing to do, right? So for, even from a marketing perspective, if you try and do a marketing plan without a vision and mission, you're just going to completely fail. You won't even be able to describe who your customer is. <laughs> it all starts with that for a company. Um, it's, it's interesting, many different companies have many different cultures and some people make a lot of money like in the finance industry and stuff. And, uh, not that I've been involved in that, but where I've been in circumstances where I thought we did financially well, if you were to do that over and over again, you don't feel like you're building anything. And I don't find that personally satisfying. Yeah. yeah making the money is the sort of the bonus. Building something of value is the goal. Yeah, if that makes yeah. sense. And yeah. Yeah. look, I'm probably a little bit, uh, you know, being the salesperson, I am reasonably commercial, uh, and I am—I won't say mercenary. Almost said mercenary, but but uh, it has helped my business 
uh, grow over time, focusing on a particular uh, area of business and the problems we solve. Because one of the biggest pieces of advice that I get pushed back the most on is about niching, knowing your customer. Because uh, so many customers, I would say every single customer that comes to me, uh, maybe that's a broad brushstroke, 90% of customers that come to me say, we want to do more leads and marketing and sales. And so who's your target customer? And they give me 14 different market segments. And, and I said, yeah. well, I can't. Uh, and I often say, you know, a man that chases two rabbits catches none. So which yeah. rabbit do you want to chase? And so that is, that's where we start. Look, you can, you can spin off other business units, but at one stage I had 70 staff across five different business units. And you know what? The one that I was good at was the one that fed all the other six. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's still a, uh, a, an area of focus. How do you focus? Yeah, I, I think we, we, we'll be able to tease out a lot out of the vision mission conversation. And I know a lot of people talk about it, but they don't talk about it by relating to how important it is to growth. Yep. And if you want to achieve growth, um, and, and it's one of many, many things that, that has to has to go right. Uh, but I'll, I want to reiterate as well, like depending on the phase of your company, if you're five people, um, you will take business to survive. We've all done that. <laughs> That's, yep. um, but being consciously aware of that decision is important. Don't let it sway your, your plan as you go. And then as you become more successful doing what you want to do, then you can own it. We're, yeah. we're, we've tested the marketplace. People do what we want. What we get, what we have to offer, I'm going to own it now, and then that's when you start attracting people to you, rather than you having to go out and grab them. It's my experience. So, that's fantastic. So, um, well, I really want to continue it. this conversation, but uh, I want to also respect your time, Daniel. Um, <laughs> let's let's probably uh, let, let's let's pick up on vision and mission, and really try to help our listeners um, to to I guess. We have great conversations over the course of the last three or four years that we've known each other. We've always enjoyed each other's conversations and, and always tried to challenge each other on ideas. So that's why we decided to do this podcast is, you know, because often we'll finish the conversation. And go, Gee whiz, that was actually really useful. I learned something uh, and, 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 and I think other people might be able to learn something as well. Um, I'm not saying I've, I've got any particular, you know, great philosophical um, stance on things. Just, uh, you know, being in business for, for, for 25 years, as, as you have, uh, it just teaches a few things. And, uh, and so, Daniel, let's, let's pick it up again in a couple of weeks' time. Really enjoy our conversations. Uh, look, if anybody wants to know more about uh, what, what Clugo does and how they help businesses or, or mine. So, Daniel, so just quickly, what does Clugo do? Uh, our, our part of the growth curve for customers, uh, when you're growing, you're about to break out and you need a really good business platform to manage all of that. That's what our ERPs do. So uh, we help companies through that. Where we're unique, though, in the ERP space is we do a complete deployment and build around customer journey because we think many companies fail to do that and they tend to fail on getting the accounting right and the inventory right. You, could, you have to do all of those things, but you've got to link it together for a company to grow successfully is our, is our opinion. So that's what we do. Thanks for the uh, free advert, Matt. <laughs> no problems at all. And, <laughs> and, uh, and people will probably already know that, uh, you know, we do sales and marketing for technology businesses. And we really want to make sure that there's a there's an alignment between that those two skill sets. We want to stitch those together because if they play together, actually, the first version of my business was called sales. It was, was, was a terrible name I came up with for only about five minutes called Sam Plan awful but it was sales and marketing playing nicely uh so um so that i yes, so right, if you Matt, Google Sam Plan, you'll see some really <laughs> primitive videos of me and my business partner tracy talking about stuff so if you want to if you want to see something uh it technically it's correct information but uh it was executed probably could have been done a lot better anyway ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for listening or watching really appreciate it share it with your with your business colleagues we love getting feedback this is all about growth and we want to talk about new topics. If it's just Daniel and I yakking away, we can we can do it. But if there's a particular topic that you think, you know what, I want this, I've got this problem in my business or I'm or my conversion or my my customer journey or or there's some element of it. What is a customer journey? I've never mapped that. Let's let's really go into those things. I want to map that stuff out for you. And, and Daniel is, is incredibly skilled at helping businesses really see their their business. In a, in a way that allows them to find the areas that need tweaking and, and turn those dials um, to, to create a better result for not only the business, but actually the end customer as well. So look, thanks again, Daniel. Looking forward to talking to you again next week or in, in a couple of weeks. And we'll, um, one final note. 
Well, no, no, one final. If you are the person that takes us from seven to eight followers, big hugs. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. That's it. My mum and your, and your family are, right. are all, all subscribed. So uh, we need one extra person this week. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> See you, man. See you, man. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the CEO and Salesman podcast. If you've got a leadership, sales or business question, we'd love to hear it. And of course, we'd also love to add our two cents on the subject. Tune in for next week where we talk about all these things and more. Bye for now.